Welcome back, everyone, to the Arc Light League. It is week three. I am DM Ramada, and I am joined today by Josh Lau, and we have two fantastic games for you with some great matchups. Josh, how are you doing over there? Doing well. I'm excited to get into these matches today. Heavy Hitters has uh, been a real success, and you know we've had a lot of great games in this league, and I, I think today's matchups will be no exception. Yeah, I agree. And into week three, we go with Rhea Adams versus Michael Yasker. This is a Prism versus a Dromai matchup. So I think without further ado, we should just jump right in and see how this yeah. game unfolds. Yeah, let's see how this goes here. So you are the uh, <laughs> illusionist uh, main around here. And uh, I guess we're going to be deferring to you for a lot of things. Uh, is there anything about the equipment setup here that uh, catches your eye? Uh, to me, this looks very indicative of a standard uh, sort of run through for both of these heroes. I do want to point out we have Vestige of Soul uh, up mm. at the top there for Prism. Uh, and that is fantastic with the sort of the old school tome combo. But everything is pretty straight up and down on Michael's side. He is running the Mage Master boots down there, as you see. So that could point us in more of a mid range to a control version of the list that's trying to play more of the big dragons and possibly a uh, tome of Fiendals. But kicking things off as you sometimes do by popping the gold, paying the two reds, creating the two ash, and drawing into the card. And playing a Thamai, which has some <laughs> bearing in the matchup, but is also just a fantastically, uh, you know, big, beefy dragon to get down on the board, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, I think this is something that we're going to be talking about consistently, is that clearing dragons is not going to be easy for a deck that uh, doesn't have a weapon, a traditional swinging weapon, and has to send mostly heralds across the across the line here. Um Speaking of heralds, here we go, here we go. Herald of Ravages here. Yeah, kicking um, things off right away with a blue Herald of Ravages with the go again off of the brand new Luminaris. Everyone's uh, sort of talking about how this deck list has sort of changed and evolved and really improved a lot because of that new weapon. Giving go again to uh, your first Herald and your first Angel attack as well. Yeah, imagine having to pay two for go again. Oh, that, that's so 2023. That is so <laughs> last year. Now we are on that new tech and sending two uh, big heralds. Uh, and then there's the pop follow-up from Michael's side of things, sending uh, the CNC onto the combat chain to uh, break that up. Ponder is going to trigger here off of that uh, figment that came out from the first hit, and uh, that's going to give us a five-card hand. But man, Rhea having to send that first attack to the Thamai and clear it because she just is completely locked out of playing at instant speed uh, and using some yep. of those instant effects on the opponent's turn, and that is not where you want to be as Prism. Oh man, we got a turn to rake the embers here and several Ashwings hitting the board here. And these are, I imagine, are going to be a complete nightmare for Rhea to clear here. Um, Prism is, is not a, very capable of popping dragons, doesn't run a lot of non phantasm attacks. The, the deck really kind of pins you into playing, you know, these uh, heralds and a lot of heralds yellows, and not a ton of space is there for poppers. Yep. Yeah, the only one that really jumps to mind is Celestial Cataclysm, um, which uh, is a non-illusionist card, so it does pop. Uh, over on the Dromai side, other than Command and Conquer, is there any other poppers that are very, very relevant in this matchup? So the Big Dragon list does play some number of uh, Cadaverous Contraband, which is a uh, non-Phantasm ah, phant yeah. attack. If you're playing a more aggressive mm -hmm. list, you might be playing three Nourishing Emptiness for some uh, great little nourishing uh, mm -hmm. turn zero draws. Uh, mm -hmm. But, you know, that card does not pop a, a Herald of Triumph, which is coming down onto the board yep. right now. And this is a very scary and very potent Herald in every single matchup, isn't it? Yeah. Herald of Triumph is really, really scary because paired with the Halo of Illumination, like you bet you basically have to be attacking at brute levels of, of damage for it to actually be a popper. Um, because one of the tricks that we're likely to see is the Halo going to be tutoring out a uh, figment of triumph, which may or may not be on the board. I'm not actually sure what 
<laughs> so it's kind of hard to see. It looks like figment, two figments on the board. Figment of protection came down, creating a spectral mm -hmm. shield after the on hit yep. goes through, uh, pitching into flipping that uh, Aegis Archangel of Protection. Wow. That figment turns into Aegis, and we are going to send that for an attack with Go again. Now, this is a non poppable, if you will, attack. This is an yep. angel attack, and it does have Go again because it's the first one of the turn, thanks to the brand new Luminaris. So this is one of the ways that uh, Rhea can clear the board or could uh, be pressuring Jeremiah's life total here a little bit. Um, Choosing it, it at like, this uh, moment, I believe she actually gave up the uh, the second card in Soul there so that we could activate the uh, win attacks effect of Aegis that is going to create some spectral shields, which mm -hmm. is uh, quite potent in this matchup. You can't attack like OG Prism like you used to do, but it does provide a, uh, a lot more protection in a low yep. life total game. Yeah, these, these spectral shields are going to be very, very important because uh, they they have ward just like the uh, Archangel does as well. But uh, Rhea can order the triggers so that the spectral shields pop first. And I'm sure sure that's something that we're going to be see, seeing going on here. Kyloria uh, Kyloria comes here. down onto the board. That is a that is a big scary dragon. But like you said, yep. uh, the spectral shields will come into play greatly if she wants to give a single three block card. She can have the spectral shields soak up that last. And Kyloria attacking isn't the end of the world, uh, be, and the end of the turn I should say as well because we have uh, a lot more dragons and two cards plus an arsenal to uh, play on the Dromai side. We have a Halo pop here. Are, is this to uh, if? If the Kyloria is targeting the, uh, the the angel, I think we have the. Uh, I'm not sure which which figment got tutored there. So she brought figment out of figment five. of ravages, which deals ravages. arcane okay. damage, uh, and I think she dealt arcane yeah. damage to her angel, which uh, yep. means you've taken away the target that Kyloria was perhaps. Yep. Uh, you know, angling down. And if that's the case, then uh, go again will not resolve on Kyloria's side, meaning that you don't have an action point yep. to play with. So a, a really heads up yep. play from Rhea. And not only that, yep. she follows this up because we've sunk something into our soul. Mm -hmm. She follows up a Tome of Divinity to basically just replace wow. her <laughs> hand and have a five really card nice. hand. Yeah, that's really, really nice and really, really heads up play there. And that's one of the risks of sending your attacks at the angels is that if they still have Halo, they can do that trick with the uh, Figment of Ravages. Really, really nice play there. And um, starting things off with a blue Wartoon Herald, but it is coming for yep. seven because it is buffed up by that Pierce Reality we were able to play on the previous turn from Rhea's mm -hmm. side. Coming across for seven, but there is the pop. We have the one resource floating for the activation of the Phantasmal Footstep, so I, I would imagine we'd see that activation here, and mm -hmm. we would gain that action point back, thus allowing us uh, to continue our turn. Still three cards at hand because of the uh, tome from the previous turn. Um, do you think we're going to see uh, any of these figments flip into angels this turn, or is it more beneficial just to keep them around? I think uh, it also their pigment form. It's a very real possibility that you could make that play, but in doing so, you would have to pay the resources to flip. Uh, and then also follow that up with uh, paying for those attacks. And then what are you getting out of it? Maybe you're getting an arsenal. Maybe you can cover all those. But in this case, we're opting instead. Uh, Rhea is sending another Wartoon Herald for six damage and possibly just giving you the arsenal there. Yep. We see a popper there going into the pitch zone here. So that's something that uh, Jeremiah is definitely going to have to be aware of. Yenderai coming out here. <laughs> That's a fantastic dragon just yeah. in general, just has a mm -hmm. really hard to deal with body. A lot of uh, Rhea's attacks can go into that and remove it off of the board pretty much straight up. Nevertheless, that's basically just an entire attack dedicated to one card. So you're trading one card for one. Uh, the previous attack did hit, by the way, and we did grab Figment of Triumph, which is going to have effect if we flip and go forward, uh, taking away those poppers, of which we've already seen two from the Dromai player, but sending the dragons across one after another and trying to eat those spectral shields off the board is Michael. Yep. And I presume that this uh, Pierce reality uh, become a target of one of these uh, Ash Wings. I think that's something that I don't think the Dromai player wants that to be on the board for too, too long. Uh, just accrues a good amount of value, especially in a deck that's sending Heralds over. 
And there is the attack, like you mentioned it, the attack with Yenderai going into that Pierce reality. That is a uh, card with Spectra that lives on the board. Spectra, of course, a keyword that is uh, reviled in the flesh and blood <laughs> landscape uh, for basically just robbing you of your turn. And uh, that is going to force the one card plus Arsenal hand to essentially just be all she wrote and pass on over yep. to Rhea's side, sending another Herald of Triumph Red, staying in this game and keeping it close. This is, I would call it an uphill battle for the Prism player, but Rhea's showing how just a, a really well-timed Halo of Illumination can start to really yeah. pivot the tempo. Yeah, that's one of the cards. Halo of Illumination is one of the most critical cards because it can allow you to tutor for a wide variety of things, depending on the situation. And surprisingly, uh, you know, Dromai is down 16 life, uh, whereas Prism's only taken three damage here. Uh, who, who do you think is uh, currently uh, in a better position here? It's really hard to tell when you're looking at the board and you're, you're just seeing all of these figments down. Uh, it's mm -hmm. tenuously, I would still say, on the side of Dromai because all of these dragons are so much harder to deal with. Uh, as they don't get removed off the board via damage to the opponent like you would yeah. if uh, we see an angel flip here, which could be the case and could be on the menu if that figment of war is sort of tempting Rhea to flip. Uh, we we did have a connection with a herald, and that pulled figment of war, making that, uh, making that courage token that we see next to it. So we could see a possible flip from one of these heralds on this turn, depending on the resources, of course, that we have available to us. Typically, uh, prism decks are running like six figments or so. So, is the is the prism in danger of like running out of figments in this matchup? You can or always run out of figments, certainly. But the question becomes like: Is the figment plus herald your win condition? Are you trying to somehow mm -hmm. uh, just push damage over the top? Like, what's the play? And of course, when you when you choose to flip is the other question mark. Uh, that is. I would call it the sign and the hallmark of a really, really great player knowing when the right time to flip is. And look at this. We have a punch in on the Enderai, removing that off the board via the uh, Courage uh, token, pushing that a uh, five attack to six off of a blue. And then the activation of Silken Form here. And that gives us four Aether Ash Wings and all oh, we follow it up. We had oh the popper in <laughs> hand, but we follow it up with another backbreaker of a card in Rake the Embers, making three Ash Wings, putting our numbers to seven, and then just saying, well, you're seven damage on the board from now until the end of the game unless you draw another Sea Cat, right? Yep. And we know that one of the Celestial Cataclysms is at the bottom here, and all these flying Kadachis here <laughs> coming across... Uh, this is going to take a quarter out of Rhea's life total here. Uh, this, she can't really maintain this for very, very long. Um, this is the power of a Dromai too, being able to turn yeah. basically a two card hand, not even probably using the arsenal this turn, but turning a two mm -hmm. card hand into just seven damage turn after yeah. turn after turn. If you have a one card hand, that's a playable red. You can turn that entire board of dragons into, like you said, flying Kadachis. And this is what we yep. see right here. Mm -hmm. Rick the Embers is actually one of the cards that it's like it's one of the hardest to put an exact value on. If you see them very very early and the game goes quite long, uh, they that single card could be worth more than ten. Um, and it obviously depends on the matchup as well. But this is definitely one of the matchups where uh, all these flying Kadachis are definitely going to put in a lot of work. Uh, speaking of putting in <laughs> work, Herald of Erudition here probably going to get the armor here. This is a huge um, moment, in fact, right here as uh, we're already in the resolution step. I was going to say this is a quite possibly oh, one of those moments where yeah. we see the flame scale furnace plus a card from hand come down and uh, block this Herald of Erudition out, which can just snowball in insane fashion if we draw into tomes mm -hmm. and uh, open up so many, you know, terrifying avenues. We do already have a bunch of our figments down and onto the board. In fact, that is our sixth figment. If memory serves correctly that's figment mm -hmm. of rebirth uh but uh, not giving the equipment here means that we have soraya flipping on oh, over boy. archangel of erudition which is going to come in for four with go again uh let's see if we dump the soul we are going to dump the soul to draw yeah. two cards draw. here yep one soul for two cards seems like a good deal to me um and it has go again thanks to the new luminaris as well so ria can uh so she's already attacked with a herald, already attacked with an angel, 
and still has five cards here. So <laughs> she might actually end the turn without being able to use everything in her hand. I think that is a distinct yeah. possibility. Yeah. Sending seven yeah. with no go again. We don't have much in the way of recourse unless we're playing the uh, single dusk till dawn instant that gives a go again. Uh, which is uh, very rare in general, but we could see that come down. Nevertheless, this is seven damage on the face of it. And uh, Michael's been very uh, okay with just taking the damage and yeah. just saying, you know what? My life total in this case is a resource. I have a five card hand. Maybe we make ma uh, I, use out of the Mage Master boots on his following turn. If we take this full damage, we might see a very big power turn on the side of Michael. I think part of his decision-making here also has to do with the fact that there's a Celestial Cataclysm in the pitch zone right now. Um, he knows the position of all the poppers now in the Prism deck, if I if my memory is correct. So if, if he knows that uh, his dragons won't get popped, he's very, very likely to just push here. Um, Ray is sitting... a bunch of dragons under the board. Yeah, that's right. There's seven dragons just waiting there to uh, be unleashed upon uh, the figments, and in this case, the uh, Soraya Archangel of Erudition. That's going to have to basically do everything it can to get max value out of its four health and four ward effect. But uh, Rhea here sitting at 1-0, and oh, picking yep. up a win uh, in week one. Yep. And uh, on the side of Michael, sitting at 1-1, one and one, trying to pick up his second win oh. of the tournament. There is a full... A uh, two-card wow. block, I should say. Not a full uh -huh. block, but a two-card block. This is going to send a card to the soul. And I believe we might be out of figments at this point. But, oh, a flash down of an Arclight Sentinel oh. means this turn pivoted oh, hugely. Man. And that's the other way to use your entire hand, isn't it? Wow. That that is that was a great draw there. And also got to pitch the Light of Souls. So another card entered the soul, I think. So we got an ALS protecting... Soraya right now. Uh Cro okay, Chromai, one 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 of the few ways to uh to help here. So forced to attack into the Arc Light yeah. Sentinel is Chromai. And in doing so, it will remove it from the board, uh, giving us mm -hmm. the capability to then flame scale furnace. But unfortunately, if memory serves correct, Chromai doesn't, oh, doesn't gain that it. action point, so yeah. it doesn't dance around it. Nevertheless, yeah, yeah. it is a great dragon to have on the board. And uh, mm -hmm. it is very dangerous to see on the side of Rhea. You don't want to see a mm -hmm. Chromai on the uh, other side, especially when you need to maintain tempo. And that's exactly what mm -hmm. we see is the removal of the Chromai immediately, a snap take from that uh, Archangel of Erudition going right on in. And again, another banish uh, from the soul and a draw two on the effect of Soraya. Yeah. Lots of uh, cards coming into play here. And I wonder, uh, th there's just so many figments on the board. <laughs> there's a Genesis. Like there's, there's so many high priority targets that need to be dealt with. Um, I, I mean, <laughs> this, this is getting out of hand a little bit here. So let me ask I, you this, Josh, curious. from the yeah. from the perspective of the Dromai staring down a board yeah. full of figments, which are inert mm -hmm. in, in and of themselves, but one of those angels, a Genesis as well. You know, the spectral shield is guaranteed yeah. to soak something and your opponent's yeah. still, you know, belaboring what they want to continue on this turn doing, possibly sending a herald at the face of Dromai. Mm -hmm. What do you look at in this moment and say, this is the plan of attack going in? out of, you know, this turn cycle and into the next two turn cycles? Well, the the number one priority looking at this is to get Genesis off the board. I, I think that's actually more threatening than the <laughs> Soraya. Um, Genesis just generates a ton of value. This was the cornerstone of OG Prism's uh, <laughs> aura package. And um, I, I'm also looking to see how uh, Dromai is going to use the Mage Master boots here. Um, is that just going to be for, like, Tome of Fendel, is that to get an aura on the board? What what does Dromai typically use the, the Mage Master boots for? Yeah, normally Mage Masters is more often reserved for a Tome of Fendel from Arsenal, allowing you to play that and not just lose your turn outright completely. Uh, you can also do mm -hmm. Chromai things for that exact same effect if you send Chromai. Mm -hmm. Nevertheless, uh, the full block here on the five, and both of them chuckle yeah. as they know that uh, that Miraging Metamorph isn't going to pop, but it is going to prevent... Uh, you know, any more dips into the soul with two still floating and available. There could be some mm -hmm. things that might come of it. 
Uh, but yeah, those Mage Master boots are looming large down at the bottom. Oh, and a follow-up with another Pierce wow. Reality. So the board is so far on Talishar that you have to use the scroll <laughs> wheel. Oh, but this yep. is a fantastic answer. As long as as long as you have the capability of playing out the cards in your hand with, uh, you know, no, <laughs> no worry, I guess I should say, about another Arclight Sentinel coming down, this could be another mm -hmm. turning point of the game. Mm -hmm. We... Still have two cards in hand, one card in Arsenal. The card in Arsenal has been there for a tremendous amount of time now. I'm really wondering what that could possibly be at this point. Um, yeah, it it certainly has been. You're 100% correct. Uh, perhaps we are sitting on something like one of those larger dragons, a Tomaltai, a Dominia, and we were just waiting ah, for a Tome yeah. of Imperial Flame. That can oftentimes mm. be an arsenal card because off of a Tome of Imperial Flame, plus the use of the Flame Scale Furnace, we can go up to five with a four card mm -hmm. hand. Uh, and looks like we are activating oh, the uh, Flame yeah. Scale Furnace. I wonder if we're going to see that play now. It could be a Dominia as well. Nope, it is oh. Tomaltai indeed in the pitch of the Tome of Fendal. <laughs> and let's there see what Tomaltai does as he splashes down onto the board. This is one of the biggest dragons you could possibly play. A five yep. health, five attack dragon that has the uh, on attack effect of when you attack that uh, with Tomaltai, it allows you to f reveal the top two cards of your deck. And then uh, based on the number of red cards you reveal, you can destroy an equipment with yeah. that many or less uh, sort of defense or block on it, which means you can take anything on the other side of the board. Yep, could go after the boots if uh, the Dromai has a few more poppers in the deck that we don't know about. Probably will target the uh, the vest or the gloves. The gloves give insurance against uh, Burn Them All and Asvali, whereas the Vestige has just been generating a lot of value. Um, so... I'm going to be very, very curious here to see. It looks like Chromite and Sync Below flipped. So going to be able to put some minus one counters on something and blow something up here. Revealing the two reds means we get to pick some stuff and blow things up, like you said. Let's see what the decision point is. Like you said, Null Rune is a possibility in slower matchups, but I think this is a great grab. Yep. Taking away Vestige of Soul so that you don't have the capability of pitching a blue after an on-hit of a, a Herald going to Soul and generating an extra resource every single time. Yep. Makes those tomes a little bit more awkward as well. Yeah. It makes tomes more awkward, makes uh, Arc like Sentinel harder to pay for. Um, you know, it's just a high priority target there and you know definitely taking that out is going to help uh drum eye here and look at this and all these swings of the ash wing plus the tomal tie now has this yeah. board swung almost yeah. completely in the favor of michael on drum eye. all those mm -hmm. ash wings basically just guaranteed eight up the yeah. uh the soraya on the board and now we see the prism has to decide whether or not they want to try and deal with Tomaltai in some way, shape, or form, or just perhaps send damage and try to close the game out. It's it's the classic uh, illusionist conundrum. Yeah. Do we deal with the board or deal with the face? Yeah, at at a certain point, you basically just have to go. You know what? I'm not clearing any more auras. Where where this game is ending in the next three turns, <laughs> um, and looks like Michael's just going to throw his arm. Not, I guess he doesn't need the flame scale furnace anymore. Normally you would try to save that for uh, like, that's a critical part of the game or critical equipment piece for Jermai, but it looks like he just wants to throw that with two sink blows. Well, and doing, that, doing so on a Herald of protection that was yeah. buffed by that Pierce reality is a, is a yeah. nice solid heads up play recognizing yeah. that most everything that we're playing from this point out on the Jermai side mm -hmm is uh, stuff we have to pitch for, meaning that we can kind of perpetuate that ash from this point. Oh, and look yep. at this. It's a mirror guy coming down. Yep. If we can There's follow time. this up with uh, the Chromai oh. answer, <laughs> we now have a non poppable yeah. Chromai that gains us action points and gives us the ability to clear a uh, Pierce reality yep. without losing our turn as well. Yeah, that's really, really good against stuff like Spectra. If, if uh, Jermai decides to go after... The, the face of Prism, uh, you could follow up with things like E-Strike draw a card or Tome of Fendel because you have the extra action point, which is very nice. 
There's the uh, third but, oh, pop or this, the final yeah. celestial cataclysm that has, uh, you know, made its way through the first cycle of the deck is there, which does yep. mean that we now have only one action point and uh, our turn is going to essentially end when we send into the Pierce reality. But at this point, your damage is already done. You're feeling comfortable from yep. the Dromai side. You have the board, you have the tempo, uh, really everything's coming up you on the uh, side of Michael. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is, the these uh seven ash wings have stayed alive for <laughs> feels like I, I there was a rake the embers on turn two right so the, i like these ash wings have been here a very 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 long time and the combination of chrome i'm guy is is gonna be tough to deal with here i'm very very curious to see if uh Rhea can uh, pilot out of this and that is a great okay. start, flipping Ooh. into Sekum so that we have up. access yep. to arcane damage and removing mm -hmm. uh, with the arcane damage the Chromai and then taking the Mirror Guy with the attack of Sekum. That is a very mm -hmm. uh, solid heads up play. Both of these yeah. players showing how really these nice. decks have these interesting like sideways play lines that can deal with the board. It feels very illusionist, the back and forth that we see. Yeah, this is this is actually a very very interesting match. <laughs> uh, I'll, I've I've never piloted the, either deck from, uh, but uh, in this matchup, but this this is a uh, really really fascinating stuff here. And this this used to be a matchup with, that was very very heavily in Dromai's favor, um, but now we're seeing with the new Luminaris, uh, you know, Rhea's making this a game here is able to uh, establish these uh, figments very quickly. And, uh, yeah. you know, basically churned her deck completely through all those figments, which is quite good. But this is this is a very dangerous attack because this arcane damage, if not covered up, is going to completely remove Sekum off the board. Being Ward yeah. 4, that is a uh, dangerous prospect. So now we're asking for the uh, Prism player to essentially stop our arcane damage by taking cards away and then also stop our physical damage and try to find the best value that you can off of Sekum. That uh, Asvali is coming across. Now that the arcane damage has been dealt with, you have to deal with the two physical damage and you have to cover it up completely. Otherwise you lose the the uh, angel right off the bat. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is, this is a very, very tough position here. It uh, looks like the, uh, he was attacking directly into the uh, the angel. Ah, okay. Uh, so you're right. Completely yeah. clearing perhaps via the uh, conventional way uh, with mm -hmm. the dragons that are on board. This could mean that we have a follow-up from hand with our three-card hand. Haven't made use of the Mage Master Boots, but uh, probably not going to uh, follow up with those yeah. this turn because we have the Cadaverous Contraband. And there, like we mentioned earlier, is a card that we're going to send for physical damage, but we're pitching into, which means we can perpetuate that ash that's on the board. Yeah, that's that's actually a card that also you know plays multiple roles. Could have been a popper, but uh, in this case, just getting two cards from Prism uh, going to be plenty good enough here, I think. Ooh, Looks and there's like, uh, Rhea's flipping the uh, Angel of Rebirth. That's right. Yeah, that's a huge flip, and there are some some really nasty combos that Prism can put together with the. Uh, uh, Avalon Archangel of Rebirth, if she chooses mm -hmm. to banish cards from Soul on the attack. And let's see if she does indeed to choose. Yes, she does. She's going to mm -hmm. banish a card, and that is going to allow her to get the full effect. Um, when the uh, Avalon attacks, she's going to be able to grab a yellow card from Graveyard and put that onto her uh, top of her deck, I believe. It's the top of the deck. Yep. Uh, I didn't see which card that was. Did, did you? Did you I did not that? make it out either. You know, I, I did not as okay. well, but passing on back over and, oh, well, this is another yeah. closeout card. Tome of Imperial Flame oh, number Lord. two coming down, drawing two cards, going to allow yeah. for us to pitch two red cards. If we do, we don't lose our hand. And that's really good right now uh, because it also generates us two ash, two resources. Uh, and then yep. we have three cards left to play. And of course, if you're playing Tome correctly, you have the three best cards available to you. Yep, there's many dragons here that could uh, assist in clearing out the uh, Archangel of Rebirth. And it, um, this we, is interesting because we see a burn them all. Oh, I was about to say nope. <laughs> the only thing better than burn them all and possibly Kyloria on the board yep. is something big like a Dominia or a Necria. Those types of like persistent, oh, scary big dragons and Dominia shows its head a very powerful uh, on attack as well. But starting off with the Ash Wings, baiting out those second cycle poppers, perhaps. But you know that if uh, we can get through these Ash Wings, Dominia is coming across for four damage 
and going to banish a card from hand. Yeah, Dominia, very, very strong here. And it's a it's an it's a dragon that demands an immediate answer. Um Rhea likely has that answer, but this whole turn cycle has definitely been going in the Jeremiah's favor. In <laughs> fact, the last like four or five turn cycles, we've seen the board basically trade back and forth, but we saw the amount of figments that Rhea have just slowly go down. And that's kind of the state of the game right now. And this is insane. Dominia actually goes and grabs, because we we revealed a red card, grabs yep. the only popper, the Celestial Cataclysm, from the no, no, no. hand. Uh, that was in the hand the whole time. Wasn't used to pop one of the uh, dragons earlier on. Instead, perhaps being saved for later. Maybe it was being saved to try and, uh, you know, do something on our own turn. Yeah. Nevertheless, it takes away the uh, capacity to stop this turn. And Dominia comes in for more damage. And <laughs> insult, meet injury. as Asvali splashes onto the board. And is going to yeah. come across at the end of this turn for one arcane and two physical. So do you, do you think Rhea should have uh, popped the Ashwing right before the Dominion attack? I would love to know the, why was, the early pop wasn't uh, wasn't played down. Nevertheless, maybe there's a maybe we can figure it out as she plays out her own turn in her own hand. Mm -hmm. Maybe she was looking for resources uh, to make a flip and then a swing of the uh, mm -hmm. of the angel on her own turn. Uh, nevertheless, we do have the payment there and the the send of the Victoria. Coming across, and it looks like it's just going straight at that Dominia, as it should. Remove the, the best card on the board off of the board and keep yourself at hopefully a manageable seven effective life. Yep. I mean, with with uh, Asvalice on the board here, this is at three life. This is, this is a very, very tough position. Already used several poppers as well. And the third Rick the Embers and Yendrai. <laughs> Oh, man. Making yeah, uh, that Ashwing count go up to eight uh, feels yep. quite good from the side of Michael and trying to punch yeah. his ticket on to the next round into a 2-1 record and looking like he's poised to do it maybe on this turn with all of these Ashwings. Just a, a horde, a dumpster of dragons, if you will, flying over and trying to just peck down the life total of Rhea. Yep. Yeah, I... I don't know. When's the last time you saw double digit ash wings? I, I <laughs> That's a very good question. I've played a lot of Dromai and yeah. there are very few times where I've had double digit ash wings. Yeah, he's, he's, he's very close to double digit ash wings here, but <laughs> that would be a, uh, that'd be a fantastic yeah. record to keep track yeah. of by someone. Yeah. Nevertheless, sending that last ash wing, yeah. asking for cards from this point forward, being at one and every attack is going to be a card Unfortunately, there are more Ash Wings than cards and perhaps more arcane damage than can be dealt with from the Asphaline. It looks like yep. he's going to be able to close it out on the side of Dromai. Michael pushes through and you can see they both chuckle about it. And that is going to be the game. What a game it was. I will say it was quite back and forth for that uh, yeah. the majority of that game. But being able to snowball those giant dragons towards that mid game to the end game picked up the win. Uh, on the side of Michael. So congratulations to him. What did you think about that, Josh? That that game felt like a completely different game than Fab. Like I was like, <laughs> there's permanence on the board and we have permanence attacking other permanence. It's just very, very interesting to see. Uh, a lot, nothing I've ever experienced. It seems very fun, actually. That was yeah. that was a blast to watch. And it really was a lot like I would say a lot closer. Experience. Yeah, it, it was. It was a yeah. lot closer too than you might have on paper said with yeah. like you mentioned during that uh game, the Dromai side of things has mm -hmm. traditionally felt far more comfortable and felt far more favored into that matchup uh because of the way that dragons function. Uh and uh you compare that to like angels or heralds to the same effect. Mm -hmm. Yet you looked at that game unfold and it didn't necessarily feel as polarizing as many uh, yeah. perhaps came to believe at the outset of the new Prism hero. And Rhea is one, I would say, on the forefront of that hero, trying to, to figure it out and trying to make uh, her work along with some other fantastic players uh, that have picked up, you know, major wins and uh, the like. So I don't think that's the last we'll see of Prism, perhaps even in this uh, Arclight League, is it? Yeah. I, I, I anticipate that many of the players in the Arc League have Prism on their uh, on their bucket list of heroes to play. 
because it's very it's very very fun to play and creates some very very unique games that are very very entertaining as well so seems very skill expressive as well and that actually is a fantastic lead into our next game because we have uh, a couple we got one new hero in kasai from heavy hitters playing against another very skill expressive hero and one that might just light everything up uh, and that is Kano. So let's go ahead and check out Chris Yali versus Easton Douglas. Uh, it's Kasai. It's Kano. And this is a matchup right here. I'll tell you right now. This can be. Oh, my gosh. And looking uh, at the well, equipment. There, there's a big problem with this picture here. <laughs> oh, no. Not having so, watched either of these games, there is something very glaring that we see. Josh, would you like to point it out for the uh, audience at home? So Kasai presented four equipment and two weapons and none of them have arcane barrier anything on them or spell void anything on them uh <laughs> this is uh did maybe he thought he was playing against ko not kano yes maybe that was maybe. The, the, the slight typo that we all now come to expect as a meme yeah. i will say this it appears that uh oh appears and kano's that, <laughs> going first oh no <laughs> it appears that chris is here for a good time perhaps not necessarily a long time uh, yes i have sat on the kano side of things into an opponent with no arcane barrier and I will say, there is no greater feeling of euphoria in flesh and blood when you know that everything you can do oh, is man. unstoppable. And starting off with a oh, red boy. aether flare, uh, that uh, is a good way to start. After that connects, we get the uh, follow-up with the blue aether spindle that is buffed by that aether flare, yep. allowing us to casually opt six on turn yep. zero. Yep. I, the most interesting thing of this whole like video here i think i'm just gonna be looking at chris's face a lot <laughs> he's got the face of like it's okay yet yeah, it doesn't hurt it's, everything's fine it is the perfect dog he's, he's got a surrounded face. by fire meme <laughs> yeah sitting yep, there exactly. sipping the coffee saying everything's fine please someone take and edit that post it on twitter yep. because i will tell you right now that is the possibility. That is a possible end game state. I can't imagine this game will go too very long. That being said, yep. from a specific matchup side, Kasai has a rough matchup in general into Kano, I would say, from playing it from both perspectives, having played both of these heroes a good bit. Mm -hmm. It doesn't feel great from the Kasai side. Would you agree? Yeah, Kasai, even if it's built with like, let's say you, you run with AB2, let's say you run with cards like take it on the chin, let's say you have an Oasis Respite and Tunic, uh, you add all those things together, it still doesn't help the fact that your list is slow with no on hits, and you have to work very hard for your go-agains, uh, because Kano's not going to block your heart streak with an attack action card anytime soon. You're exactly correct, and like you said, I you almost have to, into any Kano, really, you almost have to pressure heavily as quickly as possible and put them in their own sort of sticky situation where they have to make their own tough choices of blocking versus uh, trying to uh, play out combos or damage on their own turn versus your turn. Yep. And that's probably the uh, line that Chris is going to try and take here, put as much damage on the board as quickly as possible so that, and there it is. Yeah. In the swing, a fantastic yep. card to have in the mid game. If you're playing a more slow tempo matchup, uh, so that you can push, you know, gold and copper on hits. Instead, we're just playing it out because we need damage. Yep. The Kasai has got to put lethal on the stack as quickly as possible. Uh, even <laughs> the, the thing is, even if Kasai is going like as fast as possible, I don't think he can present lethal within three turns. Uh, that's kind of the issue here. And Easton having chipped down already 12 health still going to be able to send something across swell tidings mm. here got to get the surge bonus as well <laughs> that is that is i i've played a lot of kano i've played a lot of kano and cc and blitz i'm not the best kano player in the world i will not attest to be but i will also say that i have never resolved a ponder token off of a swell tidings in my life <laughs> and that is yeah. the, that is an opportunity to do so right there yeah, that's normally they, they'll block a little bit of it, uh, but uh, when you have AB0, that's just not even happening. The game, Talishar is not even like presenting a menu asking how many damage you want to pre pre prevent. <laughs> it's just literally subtracting your life and passing the turn. 
Now this is a great uh, this is a great pressure sort of scenario where we are uh, you know playing down we play down a slice and dice we have the possibility of creating a gold we know the Blade Runner follow up is there oh and drawing in, drawing into another in yep. the swing means we're actually presenting ten damage here putting our yep. opponent down to six we do have an yep. arsenal available which if that is you know like you mentioned either some damage prevention in the form of take it on the chin probably not an oasis respite by the way that we're playing out this turn with uh, no tunic up but if it's yep. some sort of damage prevention that could prevent uh you know a big combo turn from just blowing us out or it could even threaten more damage over the top now we don't have iron song response available to us like you would uh you would uh, uh, traditionally hope for because there's no block on this and reprise is not active but it could represent you know the third copy of in the swing maybe yep could be that's a, you pointing out the fact that there's a tunic here is actually very, very important because normally Kasilis are not running um, tunic unless they're running shunts. And at that mm -hmm. point, if you're running shunts, you might as well run Oasis. Yep. So that might be something that, you know, going through Easton's mind here is like, he's like, okay, maybe I just got to chip down a little bit more um, to ensure that even if he has an Oasis, I could still kill him through, um, you know, a wildfire that's only landing for two. Yeah. Um, so looks like going to Kano here. Is that yep. what he did? He Kano's into a Sonic Boom off the top, uh, deciding whether yep. or not he wants to maybe Crucible Sonic Boom, uh, and then also deciding how uh, greedy he wants to be, I guess. We, we haven't used the action point on the side of Kano this turn, meaning that we mm -hmm. can play something from hand first, or we can follow up after we see the Sonic Boom resolution and possibly what we see off the top. Uh, Sonic Boom is one of those cards that uh, really makes you wonder, or I guess I should say, it, it makes you think about what you're going to, uh, you know, possibly run into off the top if you have uh, more tomes or more uh, items. But this is the other way that you can play a Sonic Boom turn by using Lesson and Lava to basically just pick what you want to put off the top yeah, and not have to worry about Sonic Boom missing. And that is a very potent combination. Yep, especially, uh, I mean, we're just seeing the, the the power of AB, or Kano against AB0, getting to tutor for anything you want, not worried about Lesson and Lava getting <sighs> AB'd. Oh and no! Oh, oh no! So this this speaks to what could possibly be an arsenal or in hand, yep. especially with the resources available. Like he's doing the mental yep. math there. Lesson and Lava puts that red Aether Flare off the top, and we are going to be able to grab that with Sonic Boom. Uh, do we didn't see the Crucible activation, which is a, is an interesting prospect here. But nevertheless, the uh, Sonic Boom is going to probably grab that uh, Aether Flare. We might see the Aether Flare played alongside of the Crucible activation, and that could mean that we activate Storm Striders and go yep. blazing Damn from it. Arsenal. <laughs> to try yep. and close the game out on our own turn, a very rare own turn possible kill here. That could, that could be an achievement unlocked here. And here we go. Aether flare with crucible here, pitching a blue here. Now it just comes down to what's an arsenal. <laughs> The Aether Even Flare. something like Snapback would do it here too. Snapback Although would be, be quite good. Yeah. It would be a lot of extra damage there. The activation of the Metacarp is here. Uh, interesting to uh, see the activation here and perhaps not on the previous turn or the previous, uh, you know, damage dealing spell. I wonder if he let it resolve. It looks like he did based on the uh, side there. Nevertheless, this is going to push five damage and there is a take it on the chin. So that is going to be played out there to try and stifle some of this damage. It will give the agility token as sort of a consolation prize. But the question is, how low is he going to go on this turn? Because there is the blazing <laughs> aether. Yep. And blazing here, gonna come in for <laughs> just a gonna do damage. it. <laughs> and exactly lethal, actually, very nice. <laughs> Both players just absolutely chuckling. The agility yeah. token there was just purely for the uh, the memes of it all, but did not have the capacity to stop the damage. And yeah. a, a rare, <laughs> a rare on turn kill from the Kano using yep. the uh, using the Storm Striders not to uh, activate on your opponent's turn, but instead to just close the game out on yours. And like we said at the outset, when we saw the uh, Arcane Barrier, or I should say lack thereof, uh, that was going to be a, a good time, not necessarily a long time. Isn't that right? Yep. This this is the, the thing that Kano mains dream of, right? They just wake up and they're like, round one pairings, and then they, they see like their opponent doesn't have any AB. And it's, you know. It definitely uh, speaks to where this meta might be right now and why we saw some success in the first uh, round of RTN season this most recently yeah. with uh, with Kano doing quite well and uh, making people ask the question, well, how do we deal with that with our uh, current sideboard list? But here, 
picking up the win is Easton Douglas on Kano. So, wow, two two barn burners of a game. I'll tell you what, we had a uh, yeah. Prism versus Dromai uh, illusionist mirror match, if you will, all about the board state, very back and forth and grindy. And then Kano did Kano things to uh, yeah. round us out on our two game series here. Yep. Yeah, a, a wide contrast of uh, games here. <laughs> Of the Arclight League, a uh, fun little endeavor here where we see some of the best and brightest in flesh and blood. Just throw down Flake alongside Casanova. This is our first time together. Yeah, first time on the mic together. We've both like seen each other's work in other games, flesh and blood, whatever, for the past, you know, I don't know how many years, infinite number of years. And now we finally get to jump on the mic together for a, a great bout between a couple of our friends, Lucas Oswald, Majin Bay. Going to be on our heroes, respectively, as well. Levia for Lucas and Bravo for Majin. Very, very exciting matchup between these two as we'll jump into it. Yeah, I mean, talking about heroes, I mean, Bravo, obviously, my my hero of choice. But Majin Bay also my hero of choice, which is great. So I've got, like you said, two great people within the community, Majin Bay, Lucas Oswald, and Majin Bay not on Wizard, just in general. That itself has to be a little bit of a, of a, a sort of counterculture move here yeah it's been it's been a bit crazy right because of course with the rules of the arc light league you can't just play the same hero through like and all of the weeks but so far we have yet to see majin play i believe you get three plays of each hero and majin has stayed away from kano saving that for later on and gonna be kind of stuck in this bravo matchup against Leviah. and recently i've been feeling like Leviah has such a great time against the guardians but particularly I think Bravo ends up being a bit easier uh, than the victors at this current moment and a good start from Lucas to be able to get some graveyard fill going immediately and dominated starstruck comes across, but Leviah doesn't care about that too much. A lot of times that crush effect uh, doesn't quite hit the uh, numbers that she likes to pump out. 
Well, Starstruck is they're going to be hunting down those low to the ground heroes, the ninjas, and anything that really has an attack value of probably like six or less. But I mean, when you're throwing a swing big as the response, it doesn't really matter. You can crush me all day long. But in that case, Majin just happy to just sort of sneak through with a little bit of damage, finding those three blues as a Bravo early on and some gas. That is how you want to start it off. But Majin's got some decisions to make. The swing big option here is not necessarily as spooky as it sounds because the frankly the the quicken token that you're giving up here is really going to be lost to the fray for bravo so a uh, standard little hammer fare here is a titan's fist is the response it's probably the right way to move a, uh, move forward here yeah for sure i mean it, it, realistically the quicken's not going to do anything just get the best block that you can in uh, as you're saying and you know what's interesting is seeing the hammer instead of the anathos oh, oh wait a minute we'll get into that but I did just see, this is Shadows of Blasphem Fett. Usually you want to see this so early against Bravo, get your recursion piece. But that was a discard on a Blood Rush Bellows. So not only do you not get your recursion piece, but you've just lost a Blood Rush to the Void. That is a tough, tough ask here because a lot of the work, a lot of the heavy lifting is going to be not off those Blood Rush Bellows turns. I mean, typically Bravo can block out where necessary. It's not necessarily going to be a game of attrition for most part. I think that Majin here with some of the equipment still in uh, in tow can kind of pick and choose places where he wants to swing back for devastating effect. He did give up a Spinal Crush as a defensive piece here, which can really hurt Levia, who wants to throw two or three attacks at a time. But take a look at this. It's going to be a... Uh, that is a choke slam. A red choke slam is going to be the follow up here, which, you know, it's not going to be dominated cast. But at the same time, this has to be respected, because if you if you see a Levia player, they want to go over the top with some of these attacks. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you, you kind of have to just deal with these crush effects as you go. And Lucas, as much as he's not able to find the recursion piece via the Shadow of Blasm Fett, does end up getting to throw this deep rooted evil on this turn. The agility going to go to waste. Of course, here from the earlier smashback, due to the need to block out on that choke slam, can't afford to just take that full eight damage, but still might be able to start getting that recursion engine going. However, the big thing to look at is the graveyard has 10 things in it. So finding that deep rooted is not going to be guaranteed. That's a really difficult part that a lot of players are going to look at Levi and say, oh, it's there's so much power involved in this but curating that graveyard in and tossing the right amount of of you know cards out into the banished zone to get the extra value is pretty difficult some of the best and brightest when it comes to lafaya know that they want to operate with a graveyard of, of about four to six cards they want to have a little bit of guarantee when it comes to that and being able to fill and then empty fill and empty on a consistent clip is very important here as majin bay is looking at the second swing big already and the sink below is going to meet this one halfway but again the work is getting done here a lot of these these attrition pieces but a double sink <laughs> below all right why not he's going to get a little bit of extra loot here as a quicken token gets shaken out of this swing big yeah, and once again, we probably won't be able to see any use of it just due to the fact that, you know, only two cards in hand is low odds that you're actually going to get the full value here. But there are ways that Bravo can convert off of these. We've seen, you know, E-Strike and Bravo in the past. We see, you know, C and C. Right? There's an E-Strike, right? So E-Strike potentially into Hammer could come from this with the draw card. So actually might get some use there. But Flesh Bag, this is maybe one of the best use cases for it. Just stop the Quicken from doing anything. Massive, massive use of Fleshbag. Again, the the repercussions of that card is huge. Just intimidating that one extra card, which probably represented potentially a hammer. Just finishing it off with, uh, with basically a go again that went nowhere. And now we're going to have a... Uh, th this is a dread screamer with a six go again. So just laying it on thick again, one f in uh, one float, one card in hand, wondering what is in Lucas's uh, arsenal here to really make this hurt. But we're probably going to use the yeah, there's the civic steps. And again, it seems like this whole game cast has been. Can you use the quicken token effectively? Yeah, what was quite interesting there is uh, is a little risky on the quick uh, the civic steps, because I think Lucas potentially can utilize uh, that quicken we did see the banish from the dread screamer did hit uh that deep rooted evil so there is this three cost attack that is sitting in banish that can be utilized and then if there's a one cost in arsenal there would have been the ability but it does look like majin uh walked back those civic steps potentially here i didn't see oh no there's the go again okay right if this is a blue in hand it could be a third attack but it looks like just a re-up of the arsenal from lucas instead 
that's fine. I guess sometimes you got to be a little bit risky when it comes to the civic steps. And oftentimes it's, it's like a skill check move. Like, do you have the, you know, the right recipe to really make me pay off of this civic steps was a card that when it was released in the round, the table, um, you know, to sort of boost that guardian, their weakest spot being the, the, you know, the foot piece here, having that there, it was a little bit of discussion cast people saying, well, do I really want to give my opponent a quick and token? It's all about timing. And, yep. and oftentimes if you can just have that quick and token go nowhere, that is a beautiful piece of equipment that you can just rely on as take a look at this. I mean, we're not over yet. It looks like it's going to be a plus two on E strike. One of the most versatile cards ever printed. The welcome to Wraith staple is getting some work done here is now Lucas Oswald down to 15 and already taking it on the chin. Yeah, I mean, right, the, the flip turn coming up, if consumed, is the way that Lucas wants to go, right? Already at 15. Magic number is that 13. Dead has been turned off this turn, uh, and so there is potential, if Majin wants to say, I don't want to let you go consume this turn, that he tries to hold on to some extra cards set up for a big swing to try and stop Lucas from being able to cover it up. Of course, the husk is still there, so Lucas should be able to find opportunity to get around any big attack that comes through as going to be able to use some of that recursion as the deep rooted comes out of that graveyard it's a dangerous game to play here you're pushing up against that 13 life total sort of threshold when it comes to you know the the carrion husk you're at 15 there's a situation here where perhaps oh there it is never there's mind all right <laughs> forget it the tunic connecting with two blues to send a natty uh the old natural when it comes to crippling crush there's the usage of the carrion husk finally getting getting uh getting its due as it were but again it, it's a dangerous game like we said because if majin had a pretty paltry hand and lucas had everything lining up perfectly if you just throw a four you just kind of want to take it you don't want to give up the carry us but sometimes you just have to and in this case a dread screamer red coming through again six go again finding a uh looks like a de uh, debilitate as well as a uh that was a tear asunder so laying it on thick here majin finding a hand that he does not too keen on at the same time, I mean, you got you to gotta stay alive here. Yeah, and Lucas uh, de decided to just take the damage, go below consume threshold, which means Redeem is still potentially on the table if the game goes that long. Lucas valuing, continuing to keep up the pressure, using the armor to block and just continuing to go fast. Uh, Redeemed is a game plan that I think has been quite good into the Guardians that play more defensively and try and fully block you out. While Lucas is pretty far away from getting the amount of blood debt he needs for that, it is a way that he can still look to close the game if Majin decides to go full defense now that Consumed is off the table and try and make Lucas take damage from that blood debt. Tear limb from limb coming out and gets the discard on a swing big. Down to nine a piece here. Twelve. That we'll is a dominate. big piece. Yeah, <laughs> on the dominate as well. Now, there is a full fridge here that you can toss in front of it. You got six, seven, eight block if you want to throw the, everything in front of this. Ultimately, I think that you're probably going to hang on to something like the tunic. And But this might be a situation where you finally see the, uh, see the steel blade buckler. You can go ahead and recycle a card out of the arsenal with the crown of providence to give yourself a five-card hand. I mean, if Majin Bay here has something like a crippling crush that he can dominate maybe he's got a pummel as well if he could go ahead and recycle with that uh, crown of providence to sort of close the game out that is completely a possibility here we've already seen one red pummel committed to blocking here but 12 dominate is a big task obviously we're going to see some equipment here oh absolutely and i i like the call out because looking at lucas's fridge right there's not much left in there right needs a grocery run try and refill but can't get that until the next game. And of course, Majin still has a great opportunity to try and turn this around. Nine health, no fridge against a Bravo does not feel very safe, especially since Majin still has so much of this armor block left. So looking at this dominate, we see Majin thinking quite some time on this block, and it could be the consideration of, is this hand good enough to go? Can Crown turn this into a hand that's good enough to go? And uh, is it worth the risk at this point to do that? that's basically I think what Majin is kind of agonizing over here because it's a situation where he might be thinking if this crown becomes a blue, I, I could win the game. Right. But if this crown becomes a red, I've just given up way too much damage. And then I'm going to end the turn with two cards in hand and we can't do that. But there it is. It There's looks like fridge. he's going to probably take it and make it happen here. All right. So let's see. I mean, I wonder if it is, you know, searching for a blue. I wonder if that is the big decision point here. And we're going to see what this crackback is. Five card hand for Bravo. Zealous oh, belting to start, so it's going to go wide. He left the arsenal. Now, this might be a situation where that card in arsenal is a pummel, so might maybe he's going to go ahead and try to punish off of this uh, zealous belting. Again, um, due to the nature of the game here, 
we cannot see what's in hand. So we are kind of riding shotgun, but uh, we don't have control of the radio, as it were. And uh, here's the Zealous Belting, going to get a five go again. A nice start to this turn. Majin Bay here. Kind of playing goofy because he's going with a, not a familiar hero. This isn't a wizard. It's Bravo. He wants to hit hard and make it hurt. And Zealous Belting is a staple when it comes to one of those mid-range or more aggressive toned Bravo decks. Yeah, and he's still got one floating no tunic, but it could be a red and arsenal and two blues in hand. Crippling Crush, there it is. It's exactly what I thought it might be. And that's such a massive turn. That is enormous, and I guess now we know exactly why he was so favoring that card in Arsenal. Didn't want to go ahead and swap it out. The thought, the agonizing contemplation of a turn ago for blocking has paid dividends here because, I mean, Lucas Oswald gave him the green light with that zealous belting and said, what can you possibly follow up with? I know you've got cards, but what is it, an eight? You know, is it a, is it a, maybe it's a dominated effect that I got to worry about. Ultimately, he did take a gamble himself and he is going to have to pay dividends. His crippling crush is an 11 point attack. The crush effect, devastating. Discard two cards at random if four or more leak through. But at this point, crush effect just means victory for Majin Bay. Yeah, we've talked about the fridge. Lucas, if he has an arsenal, the way to turn off blood debt, dipping below consumed, mean he doesn't have the way to bail himself out. And he has to block with three cards here or else he's going to just die. Two cards plus the one block from the apex. That's only seven. This is 11 coming in. You have to block with three cards. If the arsenal does not turn off blood debt, the game is just over right now. This is what I love about these matchups here because, you know, you might be eating it real hard against Leviathan, but if they just find a turn where they can't really pressure you that much and you can send something like Majin Bay did, that's the game yes. right there. Lucas Oswald, unfortunately, has no answer for the Bravo specialization cast. I mean, it was a hot and heavy matchup. They were swinging for the fences both ways. Yeah, absolutely. A very quick one between these two. A lot of times you can see this match go one of two ways when it is Leviathan versus Bravo, right? You either get these haymakers back and forth where the Bravo really tries to play aggressively and trade blows with you, or you get the other side where Bravo just blocks the whole time and it comes down to Leviathan using recursion to continue to try and get over that. And I think when you end up in those games, Leviathan comes out nine out of 10 times. But when it's the Haymakers, that's where Bravo can find edge. So the fact that Majin, even though he's not a Bravo player, found, you know, kind of the best way to play this matchup, found those crippling crushes and punched through and found the win. That's massive for Majin on a hero that I don't think he's played all that much. I definitely know that for a fact. Uh, frankly, <laughs> a lot of the times whenever he wants to go ahead and practice against a Bravo player, he'll usually uh, poke me or something. He's like, I need some Kano into Bravo. I need some Kano into this. It's usually Kano into something. It's never Bravo into something. But ultimately, like you said, uh, I mean, some of the times these matchups just become a matter of if the Bravo's got the pieces, they'll just say, screw it, let's, let's, let's dance. And they'll just throw everything at you and say, I'm going to get there before you do. Uh, and and you have to have the magic recipe. If you go crazy, if you go bonkers here, no problem. I've got a bunch of three blocks. I've got some D reacts. I've got equipment that can keep me alive. But other than that, if I'm finding reds and blues together, I'm going to make one hell of a party and you're not invited. So that's kind of the situation here as uh, Majin Bay on Bravo uh, takes a takes an, a, a W away from Lucas Oswald. Yeah, and that with that, that's it for this match between Majin and Lucas. We've got more coming up in the Arclight League. So that's it for me and Flake for this one. And we'll see you for the next game.
everyone, welcome to week three of the Arc Light League, and this is a banger match because it is a Brute versus an Illusionist, this time Dromai versus Reinar. Bit of a slugfest, but it is exciting because we've got Alexander Vore and Matt Coles, two terrific players pirating the sucker, and also I'm joined by Vero, new face to the casting booth. How you doing? Good. Not a good face, but a face nonetheless. And no, I'm here to, uh, you know, give you some illusionist, a little background on illusionist uh, with your, of course, your personal favorite and brute, whether it be Le- Leviah That's right. or uh, Reinar. Um, you know, you're the brute guy. So uh, I've been playing illusionist for about a year or so. I'm kind of off it at the moment, but I have a team that has a bunch of illusionist players. So I'm always uh, in the thick of it. So, yeah, we can get into it. Sweet. Well, here we go. We've got Alexander Vore on the top piloting, and this is exciting in its own right, because this is Club Reinar, Club Reinar, which is not something that's making that many waves in the scene right now. Uh, Brute in general is doing really well. Brute actually had the most wins across the board as like a, a class in this last season of RTNs, uh, but it's really off the back of Mandible Claws kind of uniting all three of these. So really exciting to see what a club build is going to do for us here. And then, of course, Matt Coles on the bottom with... Uh, I guess the the only thing to point out is this new piece, Balance of Justice, that can be run to kind of equalize a Blood Rush turn, make it not land so much damage for the matchup. You think that's uh, making its way into most Dromai decks these days? Uh, yes, as we know with Dromai from back with, you know, Redline lists, you know, as we saw Mara Faris at the uh, Pro Tour, you know, we got two, three, four, five hats, whatever it is now. But I think um, I wasn't always a big fan of doing that per se. But now with Balance of Justice, you could definitely float it in with a Crown of Providence and a Crown of Dominion or maybe just a Crown of Dominion and a Balance of Justice. And with, as you mentioned, the claws coming out all over the format now for Brute. It's something you're going to need because Blood Rush Bellows and multiple damage turns, even if it's just something like Pulping and Wild Ride, that's mm-hmm. technically drawing two cards and you can activate it there as well. So I think it's a very good choice for a lot of lists. There is some give you have to give or give away to be redundant with words, which is uh, <laughs> Crown of Providence. But um, I think it is probably worth uh, that loss if you choose to do so. Right. And with Club, Blood Rush Bellows, it's kind of interesting. You can go two avenues with playing Blood Rush in a club deck, and that's either using it as an efficiency play to basically make it a one-card seven, where you use Tunic to then play Blood Rush, which you know then throws your club for seven, you get to Arsenal the second card. So it's effectively a one-card seven off Tunic. That's one way to do it. Not high value with Balance of Justice in this like blockout sense, because you're not really going wide. Still draws you a card, which Dromai can use. But the other way a club build can use Blood Rush is actually off the back of these agility tokens that we already see coming in play now on Alex's side, because you can just go so much wider these days uh, off of Brute with, with agility, uh, not even being so dependent on Scab's rules. So you can set up with a go again attack and arsenal with an agility on the board. That's probably still a three wide turn. And then Club is only two resources for five for, or for seven damage still on that turn, which is absolutely nuts. So uh, exciting to see how it kicks off here. But uh, looks like Scar for Scar is going to be the, wait, I think, second attack of the game. I might have missed the Smash Instinct there. Uh, yeah, we, they started with the Smash Instinct. I think we might have blocked. I think we just took the whole six. And uh, as you mentioned, it's interesting with agility because usually Reiner has a thing where, especially when you go with the club, the, the claws are interesting because it's a little more aggro-oriented. But when you have the club, it's very similar almost to a Dromai versus Guardian matchup where you want to set up a board, but you don't necessarily want to give away your dragons for free because obviously Reiner has a ton of poppers. So you kind of want to play that back and forth where you'll throw out a dragon, lead with some you know of your attack actions, and then you say to the Reiner, hey, do you want to leak this damage here? Do you want to leak this damage here? And if they leak all that damage, then you just play a dragon and, and dry pass on them. Because as you just mentioned, up until recently, you know, j- brutes weren't really able to play four or five card hands very effectively. They totally can if it's Blood Rush Bellow and it's, you know, it's the whole wham shabam. But <laughs> normally you're only able to play one or two cards with the agility tokens coming in and not having to, you know, gamble with the scabs roll now. It's kind of hard to play that gambit where you're like, hey, here's some auto attacks. Do you want to leak it? Oh, here's a five card hand. I'm going to pass and let's see if you can use it. Now brutes can use that hand. Oh, absolutely. And this is interesting as well. We get an early equipment block out of Alex choosing to cover up a dust up with Apex Bonebreaker plus a card, which is, uh, y- you know, Dust Up generally seems to be one of those cards that's the on hits worth so much more when there's low ash in play. And I do believe there's only one ash on the board right now. So we'll see if that block needed to come up a bit later. Sometimes Snatch feels uh, like really pressing to, to block out, but Brute has more armor than ever before. Uh, but in, in terms of speaking to armor, Matt is probably going to have to make a decision here to block with his own because he's facing down a double might token buff on that CNC. 
Yep. And as we mentioned before, um, we're just going to get the two block on the balance of justice here. But that might have been another scenario where in Meta's path, that could have maybe just been crowned away, blocked at one card. Maybe you leak one, mm -hmm. or in that case, you would have leaked like three. But then you'd still have a three or four hand uh, card hand to come back with. Um, and as you mentioned, using the, the Bone Breaker on the dust up is interesting. But the reason I like to play now with Bone Breaker is you cover the break point. Um, so you don't take the damage, obviously. You don't give the Ash and, the conversely, the Ash Wing. And now when you be able to get the Might tokens with the new Apex Bonebreaker, I think it's really worth mm -hmm. it because, as I was mentioning before, it's similar to a Guardian matchup where if you are forcing the Reinhardt to use their poppers, it's good and bad. It really just depends how you look at it. But when you're forcing them to use it on Ash Wings, you feel really good about mm -hmm. it because they can't really effectively, you know, clear them other than a club, which is fine. You know, it's like, you know, two, three resources, kill one Ash Wing. That's fine, but it's not exactly what the Brute wants to be doing. But if they're able to trade something like a Kylori, a Yenderai, something like that mm -hmm. for one of their poppers, they feel, you know, much better about it. So I think wanting to keep the Ash low, as you mentioned, and also not have to deal with the pesky Ash Wings that we're so used to Dromai um, bringing out time and time again. Right. This could be interesting, actually, because Club Reinar, one of the things that you gain with the four base power of Club is the ability to clean kill a Miragai. That specifically is something that's incredibly lacking out of brute builds. Uh, in Leviathan specifically, you can have like Ghostly Visit, you can have Blue Dread Screamer as a way to kill Miragai and not feel like you wasted too much damage. But a Reiner deck doesn't normally get to do that simply because, uh, you know, their Mandible Claws won't do it. If they're throwing Blood Rush Claws into it, they're leaking, or, you know, they're missing out on a point of damage basically. Uh, and then it's very hard to use a Popper on Miragai as well. They'll no normally, you know, keep it uh, waiting in the winds. So we could actually see some kind of inverse strategy where maybe you don't mind just ending the turns prematurely, popping every Ashwing you can, because your club has so much more Dragon Clear available to it now. Uh, that could be, I mean, it's really interesting. I wonder how Alex is going to play this out. If it really is just a, I will block you out, clear every single dragon. I doubt he can cross that kind of finish line because there's no arcane barrier, but... Maybe there's sigils. It's gonna be it's gonna be interesting here. But it's a three dragon board that Matt Coles is sitting on now. With I mean, this is kind of the thing. There's too many dragons now for your one action point club to really deal with. No, of course. And like you and uh, you know, like you said, and as I mentioned before, it's similar to the Guardian dance back and forth. But the one thing that Reiner has over Guardian is usually in a matchup like this, you would play some dragons, as you mentioned, some things would get popped. You'd play a dragon and dry past the turn just to like not play into their poppers and give them a full card hand. Normally what Guardians have in the likes of Bravo or you know, old Tim in the past, something big like a spinal, maybe a crippling if you're Bravo, or some big attack like that. Reiner doesn't necessarily have that as much, but what he does have, as you mentioned with the club build, there are some turns where if you like deem the dragons on board not that threat worthy, you can come in with your barraging beatdowns, you know, your scabs, your you know, anything like that, and just push 15 to the face. And as we know, the number one thing with illusionist players, when you queue up into any match, your first thing is to always don't die. Because <laughs> you know if the game goes 20, 30 turns, you're gonna be fine with all the value. And uh, speaking of going 20, 30 turns, 20, I lost the thought coming out on turn three. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. 20, 30 turns. But speaking of that, we actually have a Lost in Thought coming out rather early um, in a game. Usually a pitch that card here, but um, we're going to see it come out pretty early here to just try to grab the tempo away here for Matt. Yeah, I think it could be playing into pitching away a better combo, uh, right? This is Chromai and then Themai next to each other in the pitch stack, which um, I, I don't think that's ideal, ideal, right? Like the Chromai, you want to be next to another Chromai, next to another Miraga, but regardless, having extra dragons all in these concentrated hands late game might be something that Matt Coles wants, uh, regardless of what they actually are. Because this dragon board is probably enough to still be threatening for the next couple of turns. Um, likely the Themai is going to get cleared out by a Romping Club here. So it just, oh, <laughs> well, and never mind, not if you roll a one. So that's the pass right back over into Matt. But luckily without Chromai, Passing Mirage, or uh, Miragai, no matter how Matt uses this hand, it's probably likely here. Well, never mind. <laughs> There's the Chromai starting. It's still likely that uh, Alex can probably stop a lot of damage this turn uh, and not leak. Yeah, for sure. And uh, as you mentioned before, you want to have the chromize and and such uh, pitched next to each other. But the problem is with those cards is that they don't they, they are ash negative. You just have to play them on ash. And going into that turn, we saw uh, Matt only have a, ze a one ash. So I think the play of Lost in Thought to gather an ash, furnacing, and then again for the billowing mirage, essentially builds him up on his ash mm -hmm. stockpile a little bit while still having tempo. So then he can further go on and make one of those plays that you described with chromize and mirror guys stacked near each other. Um, unfortunately, the one 
one was rolled and chroma came right off the top again so now we're kind of in that uh, annoying position where you play the chromite, you start with your go again, you see what your opponent does, he chose to block, and then you come with your chromite, it's going to get popped, and now here's the snatch as you mentioned, which armor was already used on, fortunately still a bit more left on the side of Alex over here. Oh yeah, yeah. So actually with the blazing, a couple damage will be leaked through in the end. So, you know, those Ash plays early game, uh, one of the things, one of the traps I feel like a lot of Dramai's fall into is this assumption that like if i just you know throw dragons they get popped i'll just keep you know flame scaling every turn and that will be where my ash comes from but if that's how you play every turn cycle the moment that that's not how it's playing out you don't actually have room to play dragon get it popped then flame scale away an entire card for an ash i mean that's not a very tempo positive play right so you do kind of instead need to find these opportunities to do what matt did last turn where you just build up a little bit on ash still make some plays and then that way you can have these ash negative pushes all at once uh there's still only one ash on the board because i, I think he did decide to turn one into an ash wing so once again, we'll need to see some buildup as the game still goes on here. Uh, and I mean, hey, all these cards facilitate that because already we see another Ash made with Flame Scale. And then what else is that Phoenix Flame doing? Probably just getting pitched in for yet another Ash to round us out at three for the turn. Yeah, no, for sure. And it's uh, it's definitely worth bringing up because, as we mentioned before, bringing in balance, balance of Justice essentially says, hey, I'm not playing Crown of Dominion, which also tells you, hey, I'm not playing Tome of Imperial Flame. And Tome of Imperial Flame, as we all know, was a huge game changer for the deck, you know, a few uh, sets ago when it came out. And that is just a card that you play that card, you draw cards, you make Ash, you look at four more cards and you say, OK, cool. It's like I have two Ash now, four cards, floating resources, and the world's kind of my oyster. But now you sit here with Balance of Justice in a more defensive posture and you don't have that access to essentially, you know, Fisher Price is my first Ash management because Ash management is the hardest part of playing Dromai. A lot of people, as you mentioned, won't really get that. And how you prescribe value to an Ash is so it's so contentious. People argue about it a lot and how you would exactly put a number on it and how is it worth throwing something for five to make two Ash when I could have thrown something for seven, like a Miraging Metamorph, but only made one Ash potentially. And, and all these questions are what come up in these very early turn cycles, because as you said, your Ash negative plays are your best plays, but you do need to give something up to get those. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is really interesting. As we talk about kind of this longer term strategy, then again, the life totals are so low on Alex's side, I don't even know if we'll necessarily get down to the dregs of the deck. This is, I mean, it, there's always that, uh, there's always those moments where a full hand from Dromai doesn't necessarily land damage, because maybe it's trapped behind just dragons that do get popped. But if Alex can't then, in return, find windows to deal his damage, uh, there's still this snowball effect on the Dromai side that can feel really good, especially as soon as they land something like a burn them all, right? Just becomes that much more oppressive. So this is Alex's first kind of freebie hand of the game. We saw Matt just develop dragons, say, I'm not throwing this board into a popper, I'll just pass here. So Alex, he was keen to roll scabs on like a two card hand prior. So let's see if he does it now for a five card and perhaps there's too much lost value if he gets a one. So he seems to be thinking through it now with no agility popped at start of turn uh it's really all down to how much go again does he have in hand and a blue barraging beatdown is you know at least a start to it <laughs> yeah it's definitely a start to get things going and as you mentioned as much as a Reinar can have a big hand and not do anything, a Dromai oh. can, as you said, and a uh, six roll okay, here, so we're going to see multiple dragons cleared, which is very important because if you can clear some of these dragons and get into these slow games, both of these players went into this game blind, not necessarily knowing what was going on. So we're going to see just 12 come at the face wow. to start the turn to begin with and say, hey, let's get our life totals a little more even and then I'll kill your dragons. Yeah. You come into a matchup like this blind, you probably boarded thinking, hey, this guy's going to have some claws, he's going to aggro me down, i got to play defensive. So you put a bunch of pressure on the Dromai, do some damage, clear their board a bit, all of a sudden they start drawing sync blows, they start drawing sigils of solace, sand covers, whatever flavor, maybe some sweeping blows, and their hands are not as threatening as you mentioned. You clear some of those dragons, then the game might start slowing down as we see life totals almost come to parity here with two more action points That's uh, on Alex. Nuts. Yeah, I, I, it's probably impossible to use that third action point. It's not what you're planning for. But the ability to still have thrown 12 at face and then with no cost to your arsenal, you know, that was just Tunic Club to clear another dragon on board. And it was a Kyloria, very high priority dragon as well. So really great turn out of Alex. And now you start to think about, you know, the kill threshold just got that much closer on the brute side because if 
Normally, you can get your opponent down to around 20 life. That's where a Reinar just knows there's enough damage left in deck to absolutely kill you. If you've dealt 20 damage without expending the majority of your first cycle of threats, like Alpha Rampages, Barraging Stacks, or just Blood Rush turns, then you just know how close the, that win is for you. It's absolutely there. You just need to survive to play those hands. And surviving is something that normally one popper can get you turn after turn. But at the same time, the burn them all clock has now hit the table as well. So the game has really ramped up here, I think. Yeah, we, we talked about it at first. We were like, oh, maybe it's going to be a really long game, really long game. And then we're like, oh, maybe this is going to be a blowout. And all of a sudden the life totals are even. We do have a burn them all on the board, which, as you mentioned, is interesting with no AB on Alex's side. But yeah, 41 cards left in the deck, three in hand. I do not think um, we've seen any of the Blood Rush Bellows. So the life totals can get very scary for Droma. You get double, triple intimidated to take 15 to the face and the game is just over. But the one interesting part, as you mentioned, with Brute players, you want to get them down to that life total, kind of finish, you know, finish them off at that last bit. Reckless Swing not online mm -hmm. in this matchup for the most part because it does not work with dragons. It will still work on the attacks, of course. Um, so if Dromai ever does get down to that precarious threshold of two or less, that is one thing that Reiner will have in his disadvantage as we see another play go off here. Two, triple, double intimidate this turn, it looks like. Uh, just six at the face, though, it looks. Yeah, it was just high roller, so there's no there's no buff, not even a conditional buff like the Brajing. It's just six, but, you know, two intims does absolutely halt some of your blocking decisions. Luckily, Droma is a bit more modal with all their cards. You know, pitching reds is generally the game plan, so you do have flexibility there. But you no longer really get to say, sure, I'll take six right now. That's not a choice you want to make, because now that would increase your kill threshold to basically like the one five card play that Alex gets to keep could kill you at that point. And sure, a dragon board can maybe build up enough damage so that Alex can never say, find no blocks. But if it's not a dragon board that's going to do that, something like Fleshback can also halt when you do lead with an attack. Maybe it was like your red go again to kick off the turn. There are ways that Alex could still say, I don't really die from this life threshold without having to give you a card. But I don't know, this is still a pretty scary board, so he might slow down just a little bit here. Yeah, this looks like a board that's most likely going to demand at least two poppers on um, Matt's side. If he's able to lead after this with an, uh, some type of attack action that has go again, it's going to be snatched this time, unfortunately. So this might be one of those hands we were talking about before where there's probably a sigil and a sink below, something to that effect in his hand, maybe two large attack actions like CNC, where he wanted to lead with this uh, Chromai, get it hopefully not popped, so he could use this action point for a snatch. Unfortunately, with Snapdragon Scalers down, he's not going to be able to get that value here. We're going to see a furnace of, yep, the sink below, mm -hmm, as we mentioned, and I assume the arsenal is probably something similar. Um, and it's a very interesting matchup because as most people in, you know, who've been playing Flesh and Blood for a while, or maybe who are new, uh, I'm just going to stop speaking because we just saw the greatest play that everybody talked about, which is might CNC for seven. What do you do here? Yeah, well, pitching away a CNC, uh, either that was because it was a double d -react draw, uh, or or Matt was heads up on this play and says, you know what, like maybe you have another off turn coming. I actually want a more of an enabler in my arsenal. It, you know, it's kind of it's kind of hard to tell at this point. He's deciding to just go ahead and protect it, whatever it is. So I do want to track that arsenal and see perhaps what comes up there. Because if that was a D-React, what a perfect lineup of plays from Alex there. Uh, just <laughs> the CNCs for seven. And it's also, uh, there's send packing as well on the list. We saw that actually committed as a popper in that turn. There's so much flexibility of just arsenal hate, arsenal hate, arsenal hate. Um, which Droma is a deck that, yeah, if they want to push crazy hands, the arsenal does come into play most of the time just because of two-card combos you're looking for, like fixing kind of how your pitch situation works with flame scale. So that that kind of hate really slows the game down. And uh, I mean, hey, a Scar for Scar at least being live here helps speed the game up on Matt's side inversely. Yeah, no, Scar for Scar, um, an old but a new card all, all at the same time. Um, as you mentioned, Mites being the new thing, very good for Brute, because as you mentioned, CNC doesn't really work with Barraging Beatdown, doesn't really work with, you know, uh, Blood Rush Bellow, but Might is just universal. It gives plus one to whatever the attack may be, weapon, attack action card, Brute, non-Brute, or otherwise. And on the same side for Droma, we see a new but an old card in Scar for Scar. It used to be an inclusion list a long time ago, kind of fell out of favor for a bit, but now with such... Um, a contentious meta of aggro decks such as um, uh, KO and Reinar and really all the Brutes and even some new Warriors, you find yourself 
in a lot more parody games as Dromai, when mm -hmm. normally you used to try to block out the brute, keep your life high, and then eventually overwhelm them, you're in a lot more parody life total games where manipulating your life totals, you know, similar to something like Icelander is very important. And being able to lead with the scar, not just for four attack that's non-phantasm, but also go again, and then a go again enabler for your dragons, as we just saw here, is a very strong play. Yep. And uh, speaking of, I mean, that just by the numbers is stronger at a zero for four, but uh, something that doesn't look as flashy, a two for six, just because of how life has shaken out in this game, actually is still a bit of a threat, even though this truly is as vanilla as it gets. There was no beat chest. Oh, wait a second. <laughs> wait a second. Yeah, I was going to say, why didn't oh, we see no. a beat chest? This card feels like it would double intimidate, but yeah. now we understand it's doing something better than an intimidate, which is lose your card, but for good. Wow, that's that's crazy. You know, sometimes with the beat chest stuff, it's just not a six in your hand, so it can just not shake out that way. Like, right. oh, you know, I'm sitting on like a dig up dinner and a barraging, like whatever. You know, these. And as are you mentioned, it was a sink below in the arsenal. As you mentioned, it just came out there, so it was a double sink below hand. They furnished one, put the other one in, and then immediately faced that CNC for seven. It's funny how these turn cycles are working out. Wow, wow, what a what an interesting back and forth there. The pummel inclusion in a club list makes a lot more sense uh, over a blood rush type of list because the blood rush decks like you really don't want to draw into bricks and a, a red pummel is a brick on a blood rush hand but the club build doesn't have to worry about that the club build you know since they're really based around tunic value plays to milk the most out of their deck pummel just slides right into that uh and so you know this isn't the perfect curve for it there wasn't like the blue pitch and then tunic for the the pummel to really go above value but it's still incredibly threatening and just landing not too much damage with that double sink below, but it's something, a little bit of disruption as well on the discard to hopefully, uh, you know, win one for the root players here. Obviously biased, Vera, obviously biased. Of course, but it's interesting that you mentioned that because leading into that turn, we saw four cards in the hand and then one in the arsenal. And when you see a Rawhide Rumble like that, it is a new card, so you're probably not used to playing around it. And as you mentioned, Pummel's not exactly an inclusion in most Reinhardt lists. And I think both of those things might have caught uh, Matt a little off guard because... You just see a six attack at you that has, if I'm not mistaken, the beat chest keyword on it, and they mm -hmm. chose not to beat chest. They're most likely not IPing themselves. So potentially throwing out a three block, knowing you have two sink below as backups might have been the play there, but a potentially just unfamiliarity in both a new card and then, as you mentioned, not normally playing Pummel against Reinar. Those two things there might have thrown Matt off. I don't know his whole hand for sure. Um, but I think potentially just throwing three there and then seeing what happened right. and being able to cover it with double sync might have been a lot better there, but we'll see going forward. No, I think that's a great point because if you, know, if you look at how the turn shook out anyway, he committed two sinks and then had to discard a card regardless. So throwing three block right in front is a bit of a hedge. Uh, either way, if it's double pummel, cool. Then you don't care that you over blocked technically by one because you're not losing that card anyway. It's just net positive. So uh, yeah, right. absolutely fantastic to point that out. We'll see if those kinds of small value plays are really what crosses the line here because life continues to trickle down very similarly on both sides. Uh, we say that and hold up, dig up dinner. Did it actually hit? I, I forget what his life was before that, but uh, the max that card can heal is three. I think he was at 11, so it looks like he did heal two, and also shuffled poppers back into the deck. There is a bit of a downside, though, on the shuffle effect of Dig Up Dinner, is that if you're going through first cycle trying to not pitch sixes, because you're using them all as poppers, you're using them as your attacks, when you Dig Up Dinner, that shuffle can send a lot of these non-sixes back to the top of the deck, like the Reckless Swings we saw pitched. There were a couple six I was tracking, like uh, there was an Alpha Rampage that was pitched in, uh, some of the yellow sixes, uh, the Pound Towns that we saw last turn, for example. So it's not like it's a, uh, a deck that is low on sixes by any means, but it is something to watch out because there's this give and take of, yes, you like the value of Reckless Swing, for example, as a brute, but you kind of don't want to see it first cycle. The moment you pitch it, you start to feel a lot better about that card, but now it could be right into that next hand. As we see, just straight up taking the four damage wow. here, it looks like we're going to see a wide uh, attack action turn here. I'm going to go with probably Rabble, Rabble, maybe Rabble, a Billowing Mirage, and then leading with either a Miragai or a Chromai here. Because as um, we saw before, we had a two different Chromai turns, but as you mentioned very keenly at the beginning, we had a Chromai pitch as well. And I think it is either this hand or the next in which it will come up. And it looks like I'm completely wrong. We're going to see a flames, uh, <laughs> Phoenix shuffles. Flame pitch it, and then most likely a two for six coming after this. Right, right. Yeah, the, and there was a Nourishing Emptiness uh, that was either blocked with or pitched with earlier. So there is at least the CNC and Nourishing lines in the deck to kind of facilitate um, this 
you know, pitch in for two resources. Obviously, there's also like the Themis you can play. Uh, or, interestingly, just generating more room for one cost. This is still just a Gogan attack before even slamming your dragon. So, you know, pressure is pressure. I, I actually like playing this turn pretty aggressively, especially if, with that one floating, if it's a Maragai... Oh, it is. Look yep. at that. Uh, so yep. Making yep. the Maragai, now you actually swing with Kaloria. The thing about doing it in that order, though, to note is the chain was then broken. So Alex does get to double block with scabs on this same turn, which actually very cleanly will answer um, the Kyloria here. Whereas if you were more face up about this play, then there would have been some wasted block on the scabs. You would have blocked with it probably at two with a card as well, right? So you're wasting one point of value. Now he gets full value if he decides to do it this way. And heads up, looks like Alex is going to do it. Yeah, it does seem like it's 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 an interesting point there because like if you lead with Kyloria or lead with the mirror guy, excuse me, and then come with all the auto attacks or the attack actions, excuse me. So I call them auto attacks all the time, which is something I do. Hey, we should play um, league together sometimes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I play, I play drum my lots. So I'm like, ew, gross. Like attacks that like aren't dragons. That's gross. But as you as you lead with the uh, Maragai first and then go with Kyloria, you know, after all the attack actions, you're per you know they know what's going on. Mm -hmm. But I think leading with it up front or leading with it at the back end, despite giving them the extra card, is still great. Because you leak that damage first because they're unsure of what your turn is. Then you come in with it, they block boots and a card, but then they still have to pop your next thing. And as you see, you're only giving them a one card hand, taking four. You know he's going to kill your Miragai anyway. So it's essentially like a free turn, uh, no matter which way you play it. But I think you get more damage up front with uh, playing the uh, uh, attack actions. Right, right. Yeah, and you know, with uh, taking a turn still to just slam the attack actions as was done there, all of that damage that lands gets you now closer to what... Matt Coles is hoping for, obviously, which is a burn-them-all definitive win condition. Uh, especially when you play out a burn-them-all early in the game and have these kind of, these. it's not a huge board of dragons, but you know, it's, a, it's enough sticking around that you don't have to stress about, oh my god, middle of the game, will I find room to drop a burn-them-all? Will I find room to build up some dragons? He did that all early game and is now finding room as the game whittles down to still play into that kind of win con, even though there were a couple turns where the dragons just didn't swing. They they are there to facilitate this end game. And I mean, it's really well done so far. And <laughs> to note, the the only like potential punt we've seen all game was taking balance of justice to begin with. I haven't seen a blood rush at all out of Alex's deck. It's kind of kind of interesting. Yeah, the you know, going into the, the pre-sideboarding nature of flesh and blood is always interesting because you you bring certain things into a match based off of some, you know, idea that you have of, uh, of a certain deck or of a meta or whatever it may be. And, you know, as we see from Turtle Katsu all the way back at the beginning of the game to yep. Fatigue Briar or Charles Dunn, sometimes some little bruise with a little bit of, like, spice in it or just something off the cuff, um, you know, Slab Dash, another great example, is just sometimes enough to throw your opponent, like, in a fit where they, like, the play style's weird to them and then they don't have a bunch of equipment that they normally like playing and they just stare at it like, why do I even have this thing? And, you know, comes a turn where you get seen and and you're just like, oh, if only I had Crown of Providence, all of a sudden you're in your own head. Right. And a lot of these decks between the unconventional play styles and kind of tilting your opponent just a, t a tad bit um, it gives you a lot of equity, funny enough, in a game as cutthroat as flesh and blood. Yeah, well, this is really interesting to see the end game here. It's that with four life now on Alex's side, uh, in well, to be fair, there's a lot of the zero for four attacks that have been played out on Matt's side as well. I think the only ones we're missing tracking wise is more the chain ender ones, like the dust ups we haven't fully accounted for, uh, the snatches I don't think we've seen in full, but remember those ones. They're not the, the chain starters. There's at least one more red ravenous rabble because he pitched it early on. Uh, but in terms of landing non-dragon damage, that's definitely falling uh, out of possibilities here as to what Matt's hand can really do. So dealing four damage, I mean, it will at least take four turns with burn them all in play. That is the floor of what dealing four will take here. Uh, but if there are if there is this kind of turn where uh, Alex is able to just block with a singular card... Oh my goodness. <laughs> Wait, hold up a second. We got burn them all twice now in play and then a blaze headlong. Forget everything I was saying. I was trying to build up into a scenario where Alex could block with one card, keep this kind of alpha rampage-esque hand and close it, but that's just not going to be possible at this point ever. At, uh, yeah, that, I just yeah. don't think it's possible at all, right? There's two AB or two arcane damage happening this turn. There's two happening next turn and he can't keep a three card hand this turn. So it's just, I just don't think it's yep. possible. 
It's a great point you made because a lot of players, what they would have seen, they would have seen one card intimidated. They would have seen themselves at six HP and they would have said, oh my God, I got a block six here. He's going to kill me. He's going to kill me. He's going to kill me. But as you mentioned, a fantastic point with burn them all is sometimes you rely on it a little too much and you overblock that last attack for six. And then you do a very measly turn here. You swing for four, it insta gets popped and you're at like six. And then they kill you with that three or four card hand you're describing. Matt decided to say, you know what? I'm going to use my life total as a resource. As we all know, you know, one is one and zero is zero. And those are different numbers. And he used his life as a resource to play that one extra card in the burn them all which changes the whole dynamic of the game knowing now he'll probably never die to a three card hand here wow well in terms of breaking the math of this end game well i guess three things have happened now my goodness there was just a sigil played but the dig up dinner that alex dropped does actually buy him an entire extra turn because if you were at two you die on the past you could not kill yenderai with club oh wait <laughs> Well, and here we go. <laughs> There's just three burn them all. Oh my gosh. Instant, instant speed, storm striders, dig up dinner. I guess we're not going to oh, see that. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. Well, Anthony, that was so back and actually so back and forth. There was only one true pop off turn with that triple intimidate pack hunt that landed a lot of the damage that still close the gap in terms of what Alex then had to play for to wrap up the game. Kind of this one bigger push turn, but without Mandible Claws, without Blood Rush, the gaps in finding those kinds of turns are just massive. So I think ultimately that's just what didn't let him close there. But well done to both players. That now makes Matt Coles 3-0. No, for sure. It's uh, always interesting to come with a little off the spice deck like Club Reiner. And that one turn of rolling one probably didn't help. True, it was true. an amazing turn to bring it close with the 12, or I think it was 12 Intimidate, followed by clearing of a dragon. A great turn there. But you're kind of just playing Guardian Light, and your best thing you have going for you is Scabs. And unfortunately, well, fortunately, unfortunately, we saw a one and we saw a six. So, I mean, Unfortunately, that six wasn't able to clear dragons, was able to push 12 damage, but um, unfortunately, just not quite there. The burn the malls came at a very timely, um, very timely moment. And with no AB, you're like, as you said, you're just on a ticking time bomb. Right. Well, hey, that was super exciting. And there we go, folks. Uh, that's the wrap for week three of the Arclight League. This was Mansant and Vero. We'll see you in the next one.